You're listening to the world's smartest podcast network. Welcome back to another episode of Majoring in Everything. I'm your host, Andrea Jones-Roy, and we are here for another conversation with another person who is majoring in all the things. I'm so excited that she's joining the show. She is a journalist. Uh, writes all these amazing science journalism articles. She is a comedian. She runs science comedy events and is really uh, my personal hero. Very warm welcome to the show, Kasha Patel. <laughs> oh my gosh, that was too much. Oh yeah. gosh. Well, I, even as I said it, I was like, oh, I was going to say all these other nice credentials like <laughs> her TED talk on sneaking science into stand up is wildly popular. <laughs> Thrillist magazine named her best comedian to watch. I skipped all those things and was just like, I think she's really cool. <laughs> so yeah, there, just there you Google go. It. It's fine. Your yeah, yeah. personal recommendation means more than, oh. uh, you know, what some magazine says. Yeah. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah. You're like Thrillist magazine. What does Andrea think? Uh, you also <laughs> are one of the few people I know who has your very own Wikipedia page. So congratulations <laughs> on that. I don't know how how one achieves that, but that's the ultimate. Uh... You know, it's been interesting. Um, if you, I don't know how these things happen, but one time I Googled myself. I, I don't even know if I was doing that, but I, I, it showed up on Google and I was trying to see something like my net worth or something because it was like suggested. And you know how these things work. Apparently I'm worth millions of dollars. Nice. I don't know where <laughs> it went. Yeah. But yeah. People on the internet think that I'm very, very rich. Apparently. That's amazing. I the opposite. <laughs> well, this is probably the right time to bring up that we've actually brought you on the show in the hopes that you can sponsor the show with those millions of dollars. So uh, I was like, who do I know who has the highest net worth? Well, it's Kasha, <laughs> according as to the internet. As soon as I find out how to get those millions and perfect. if they went to a different Kasha Patel. Uh, That's right. Yeah. Then hit me up. <laughs> okay. All right. Perfect. Very good. Well, Kasha, welcome to the show. I uh, normally start these shows and we say, well, what were your early interests? And and, da, 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 da. and for you, I want to go backwards, if you don't mind, uh, because I know you through what I will now call the science comedy world, but I'm calling it that with an asterisk because I feel like you invented the word science comedy, <laughs> or I at least, you know, there are many people, you know, our friend Kyle and many others who do things in the science comedy domain, but I feel like your DC show, which runs monthly at the DC improv, is that correct still? Uh, yeah, no. Okay. All right. <laughs> pandemic has changed a lot of things. <laughs> I see. All right. Well, your, your, uh, very popular widely running show, uh, <laughs> DC science comedy night is the first official, place where I've seen science comedy be called a thing. So now thanks to you, I get to walk around and be like, mm, science comedy. And I don't think it would exist without you. Uh, <laughs> talk to us about science comedy. What does it mean wow. to do science comedy? You know, it's been a while. So there was one when I started getting into science comedy, I guess even to go back farther than that, how I got into comedy. Um, I was in grad school, so I majored in chemistry undergrad. And then I went on to do my master's degree in science journalism at Boston University. And the idea there was um, I was supposed to go to medical school, but I the timing didn't quite match up. So I still had a gap year. So I took the MCAT, I was going to be applying, and then I had this gap year, and I told my parents, like, hey, you know, I want to do this science journalism program, I think it will help me in science in the future anyways, with communicating. Also, I really like journalism and writing, and this will be my last chance to do anything fun before I go to medical school and my life was over. Like, I right. think that was <laughs> almost verbatim, that last section of what I said. Wow. And they're like, yeah, okay, you're going to be up in Boston, so, you know, make connections, do that, and the idea was, you're going to go to medical school afterwards, so do whatever you want for this year or so. Um, so I was doing that and it was cool. And then one of my friends invited me to go see a, a comedy show at a local club there. And the person who was performing, it was sketch comedy, not stand up. And it wasn't anybody famous. It was like by co my friend's co-workers, roommate's boyfriend. It was like enough degrees of separation that if they were terrible, I could say so and not offend anybody. Nice. But they were actually pretty funny and they weren't famous. And it was like suddenly that barrier between being an audience member and being a performer on stage disappeared. And I was like, huh, I can do that. Hmm. So I just did it to be surprising because I just thought somebody who would look like me, like lanky Indian girl, 
uh, doing stand-up comedy, which just could be something kind of fun. Um, so it kind of made sense for me to try and joke about science because I was really into science and that's what I was surrounded by, you know, trying to do research and things like that. And it didn't go over that well in Boston because I wasn't very good at stand-up comedy. <laughs> As you know, when you start a new hobby, yep, um, you're terrible at it. Yep. But it's so apparent in stand-up comedy. <laughs> of all the hobbies, I think it's the one that is most, you're just like, here I am. I don't know what I'm doing. Have a look. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. Where and it's like, I can people... build my model planes at home in the privacy of my, uh, you know, curtained living room. Yeah. And not everyone that I always curtains, thinks but... they can do it better than you too. Right. Cause you're just right. like talking, right. It's right. not like if you're building a model airplane, they're like, wow, I bet they really have good dexterity and calculation <laughs> for where that wing goes. Nah, yeah. stand up comedy. They're like, you made that dick joke and you think that's funny. I could make a better dick joke. You know, it's that right. Kind of right. Thing one upping. Um, but anyway, so I kind of stopped doing science jokes. Then I moved to Washington, D.C. for um, a job, which I got at NASA. And that was interesting because my colleagues found out and they're like, oh, do you do jokes about science? And I was like, you do a you'd come to a show about science jokes. And they're like, yeah. So I did that. And that was pretty cool. And this was in. Uh, Two thousand and maybe I want to say 18. No, no, 18. Oh my gosh. No, that's so recent. It's like 2014, <laughs> 2018, is only like two years before the pandemic. No, no, yeah. it's definitely way before then. Um, yeah, it was like 2014. So that's when I did my first science comedy show and boy, have I had a lot of learning experiences <laughs> since then, including what do I consider science comedy? Mm. And as you can imagine, there, I mean, as you said, there's not a lot of science comedians out there now. There's way more, though, than there was when I started this, you know, eight, nine years ago. There was one guy I remember who he dubs himself a science comedian and he was too expensive. <laughs> for really? Me. Yeah, because like I'm just like this little girl who doesn't know anything, just starting out at stand up comedy, like don't doesn't even know the venues in D.C. that much anymore or at that time. Right. And I don't know if people are going to be paying for this. And I'm like, okay, who does science comedy? And I Google it, find the guy who is the only one who markets himself as this. And he was like way too expensive. And I'm oh. like, yeah, I can't do this. And um, that's I'm bold, like, though. You're like, I am a comedian in a niche that no one knows exists. And uh, the price tag is for real. So bold. That's, <laughs> a, that's the kind of confidence I, I feel like I, I would like to have. All right. So you didn't book <laughs> this guy. <laughs> Um, no, but I ended up doing a science comedy show anyways, and it was kind of more, I mean, it was more open mic style where I got people who wanted to do, I, I like asked my sciencey friends to perform. So it wasn't just comedy. It wasn't just, uh, some of it was, um, songs and things like that. It was just like a bunch of nerds getting yeah. together. <laughs> and then I got, um, lucky because there was this other science comedian who doesn't, market himself nearly as big as the other guy. I guess the mm. other guy just has really good SEO. But um, he just happened to be in Maryland and he like headlined the show. And then he kind of, and he didn't charge me anything at first because he's like, yeah, you know, I'll just do it to do it. And he's been like a really good pal in getting good science comedy in here. And then of course, you know, once I started making money, I was able to retroactively pay him and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, that was, that was a different vibe. And then when a few years later, I think Kyle Marion uh, came in to New York City. I don't know. When did you start doing your stuff? I I started stand up in 2015 and I didn't really combine it with with sciencey stuff until caveat uh, for listeners. It's a venue in New York City that does sort of sciencey variety show type stuff. And that was probably 20. 18 was the first time I did anything where I like combined them. Like I would talk about sciencey stuff in my standup, but it was more like my life as a professor and complaining about students and like mm. that sort of stuff. And then it wasn't until caveat where I was like, and then I met Kyle who introduced me to you. Cause I think we met in Detroit at, yeah, uh, we at did. that science comedy show at, at a museum. And, uh, 
And then I was like, oh, there are people who like do this, do this. <laughs> that I was like, oh, we could actually like use the material, like the material from science could be comedy. And so it really was was the two of you. And, and for listeners, Kyle was on season one of this show. So you can <laughs> check out her episode as well, uh, where I was like, oh, this is like a whole genre of comedy as opposed to. Uh, what I thought was just like, if anything, I was like, I got to stop talking about this stuff. It's boring people to death because you see, no one, you know, a drunk audience at one in the morning. You're, you're like, actually, science. And they're like, boo, you know, it, it really takes some doing uh, yeah. to persuade people that it's funny. I would say, though, I don't know how big of a genre it is. It is it's literally <laughs> me, you, Kyle, a handful of people. And the problem is. And now that I've been doing this for, you know, almost a decade, um, for the science comedy shows, I've been ha- I've been struggling more recently. It was interesting. Pandemic was interesting for many reasons. Yeah. <laughs> from a yeah. science comedy perspective, I was doing like a ton of virtual shows. And there was like a while where I was like, yeah, this is pretty great. And the thing about when you have to do virtual shows, as you know, the geographic barriers are right. no longer an issue. So you really, I had to change my mindset of, okay, what would make someone book me in the Washington DC area versus why would someone book me in the world? Right. <laughs> and luckily I did already have my niche of science comedy going on. And I have like a ton of material from years and years of doing this that I was probably doing more science comedy shows during the pandemic, getting hired to do them than otherwise, because I was going to all these different countries virtually and doing that. And it was really, really cool because I could actually see what my science comedy was compared to other people's. Now that we're back into in-person shows and I'm trying to do science comedy shows again, ramp that back up to where it was before pandemic, it's hard because like you're in New York City and you're hilarious. I'm like, yeah, let's bring Andrea down here every single show, but there's only so much material people have, right? And then if I want to bring somebody from even West Coast, I'm like, all right, I got to figure out how to pay for that flight. Right. So and I have confidence that the show will sell out, which I'm very thankful for, at least do very well. But it's still, you know, you want to pay the person well and cover flight accommodation. It's just the expenses are too much. And to find somebody who has like a headliner set of science jokes is it's not just 10 minutes of jokes. It's right. like, if I'm paying you out and coming out here to do this, I need you to have at least 30 minutes. And that's a tall ask for somebody. Right. right. <laughs> that's a tall ask in, in any comedy. I mean, it's not a trivial matter to put together a 30 minute set. You know, I feel like we, yeah. you know, we see the the Netflix specials and the YouTube stuff go viral and all of that, but it's like, there's a lot of really great comedians who, myself included, I wouldn't say a great comedian, but like I could pull off 10 <laughs> minutes. I could talk to you for 10 minutes and have it be like passable. But 30 <laughs> minutes is like no joke. And if you're working in the science comedy domain, you probably don't even have that much time to practice it. That's uh, the other never thing. mind, you know, uh, uh, you know, perform uh, have the material. So for people who are listening and are like, what on earth is science comedy? If they oh, come yeah. to your show, what sorts of things are they seeing? Yeah, I probably should have started with that. <laughs> <laughs> You can cut this part in the intro. Like, we'll edit it back around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 30 minutes into the conversation, they finally define what science comedy is. Right, right, right. No, I, it's, it's we're just building suspense. This is classic storytelling. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the way that I think of science comedy is, uh, it's just comedy about science or comedy that require doesn't require but like mine's just like nerdy comedy but like even my non-sciencey jokes that I have it'll be about me growing up as a nerd and I include like math in certain things some you can check to see if it's right sometimes it is sometimes it is <laughs> but I don't normally check that much um I do jokes about funny not funny but fun or interesting scientific studies uh, my powerpoints that I do uh, I did last time we were on that show together, I did robots and I said, is this science fiction robot real? So it's just kind of taking the science that we see in the world uh, or that we might not know and then bringing it to the comedy form. Now, if you come to my show, it's transformed over the years, but you'll see people talking about science. You'll see crowd work um, with scientists. You'll see scientists doing jokes that might not necessarily be science-y, but it is a professional scientist doing right. stand-up comedy jokes. So by virtue, 
you know, that's very, very cool. And they have a little bit of that science mentality going on. Um, sometimes I do different kinds of, I don't know if I say sketches, but sometimes I had songs about mm. science, which is pretty fun. Um, uh, interactive games, um, or not games, like call and response kind of stuff. Uh, and then, yeah, the headliner usually does like straight stand up, I would say. Right. And why, why do you do it? Why do science comedy? <laughs> Um, well, I guess one thing I should also distinguish is that's how I view science comedy. Mm. Other versions of the show uh, that other people have done. Now I'm no longer <laughs> the only science comedy show that I knew of. Um, but sometimes people have a scientist. They do their science part of it. And right. then they have a comedian. So they kind of separate the science and the comedy, but they put them in one show. I right. like to try and combine like within one joke you're going to hear science and then you're going to hear a punchline about that. So I try and like make it more a fusion of hmm. science comedy. Um, and I do that because I think my number one goal is to be funny. Like, yeah, I want people to learn things. And this goes into your question. Yeah. Now, why do I personally do it? Yeah. Um, I think the greatest gift that people can give us is their time. Like, I can get money from many other places, but to get, <laughs> to get somebody. We've seen to, your net worth. We know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where it is, but you can get it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but to get somebody to actually listen to me and spend their time willingly and in cases pay for it. And even here now, I'm so thankful for your listeners for clicking on this podcast <laughs> to hear what I want to say. And I want to make it worth their time that when they, and this is kind of a general, uh, just for all of my standup, I want you to leave with a different perspective than what you came out. It doesn't have to be like radically different, but you know, my other non-science jokes are about growing up in West Virginia, which I think a lot of people don't really understand. There's a lot of bad things about West Virginia, bad stereotypes. I think people don't actually know what it is to have someone's experience there. Growing up as Indian American, you know, it's, it is a minority group and, you know, we exist and people have, again, stereotypes of what it is to be Indian. Um, and then, you know, science, I just love science. Like I do it for my day job. I think science is the greatest thing that you could possibly study because you can study science and you can do anything, even if you don't want to go into science. And this is me probably channeling my parents now because I drank the juice, apparently, even though I'm not a doctor, <laughs> but I still have a lot of respect for science and scientists. And what I've learned with doing these science comedy shows, sometimes they're in front of non-scientists, sometimes they're in front of scientists. Scientists really appreciate it as well. And I think it gives them the confidence of being able to be a good communicator of their research. And I think that especially the past few years have showed us the importance of good science communication. Mm -hmm. And I did this, you know, before any of this stuff came out. When 2016 happened, then my popularity like went up because, you know, science is under attack. People wanted new creative ways to communicate research. And they saw my comedy. They're like, this looks like fun. Um, but I did it before then. I did it because it was fun and I liked it. I love the idea of changing someone's perspective, whether it's about science or not. And uh, I wonder if you could share a little bit about why, why comedy, why not change someone's perspective through like a, a heart wrenching story or a murder mystery or like, what is it about? Is it something that you think is fun and therefore great? Or do you think there's something else about comedy that maybe opens people up to, to new perspectives? Yeah, no, great question. I guess I should clarify. I don't know if change is the right, is the right word because I'm not trying to change through my comedy. I'm not trying to change anyone's like beliefs about climate right. change necessarily. I think right. it's more of, I think, it, I guess kind of like the title of my TEDx talk, it was sneaking science into stand up. It's just showing people that science is everywhere. And there's a lot of really cool things, like the amount of times I will say who here likes science and people say no. And really? Yeah, yeah. In your um, shows, in your audiences? Oh, in non-science. Oh, okay. Audience. When I do my other stand-up, but uh, I talk my science jokes in front of them. Uh, right, okay. Yeah, but you know, it, and that's helpful because that's me talking to randos that just no, happens for to sure. be at that show. 
Right. And people will say, no, they don't like science. And I think that they just have a, uh, they just have a misperception, like misconception of what science is. So I think through my jokes, I try and show them that, hey, science can take all different forms. It's not just about, it could be about really cool technology studies as well. Um, but I, th I think the reason that I like doing comedy is it's really creative. I feel like it, for me personally, it is a way that I can mentally work out some new things. But also the power of comedy is insane. <laughs> to me, it's incredible that you can write a joke that can make like the president of the United States laugh and like a 14 year old laugh. Like <laughs> comedy can span so many different backgrounds, so many different age groups, and it can last for such a long time. There are, there are, before he got me too, um, there was, I had to do a surprise birthday party for a 40 year old Indian man. Okay. And his wife called me and was hiring me. And she's like, yeah, you know, we some of the people that we really like, you know, Louis CK has this great joke about turning 40. And to me, that was not the person who I would expect. To yeah. That's like my mom right. writing Louis CK. And I'm right. like, okay, this is interesting. So you're, even if it's not in your target demographic, one joke can hit and resonate with so many different people and people have fun with it. You know, who doesn't want to laugh? And it is a kind of like, I don't know, I, I'm not a scientist in this area, but it feel, it's like an emotional, physical reaction. Like if you find something funny, it's not just like, oh, I intellectually enjoy that. It's like, I think it's a Chris Rock or someone has a bit where that he's like, stand up comedy is impossible because you're trying to get people to have an involuntary physical reaction to something. But it really is like if you find something funny and you're la like physically laughing, like you're doing something to someone's body. That's insane. <laughs> you're yeah. not just like, you know, like oh, I read an interesting too. article. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're like, uh, uh. I mean, that's not how people laugh, but that's, that's the <laughs> idea. So I love that you. So I think about this a lot too, is, is, you know, when, when scientists are communicating their science or, or saying, you know, Hey, what I do is awesome. Or what I do is important. Or I just think it's interesting. And I want to share that with you. There really are, you know, are we telling and empowering other scientists to tell their stories and share their love of science or, or, or their frustration, you just make it more human. But then there's also this other audience that you mentioned, which is the people who say no, when you say, do you like science? And I really feel like my interests are increasingly to this group because I agree with you that I think a lot of people all over the world have have ideas about what science is and is not. And it's not like I have an amazing definition ready to go. But I feel like a lot of people are turned off of science early on and think of it as something that's like not for them. And I, I mean this group differently from the group that's like, like, I'm not talking conspiracy theorists. I'm yeah, talking like, like people who actively don't like science. It's more of the apathetic people. Yeah. Yeah. It's like I did the 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 science fair in third grade because I had to and then I never thought about it again it's not for me I would never listen tune into any science like it, which of these groups would you say you you spend you think about most when you think about your audiences yeah that's a good question I would say that I try to yeah I guess I try I try not to only lean towards people that I know are going to be into the jokes um, you know, John Oliver has said this several times about his show. And I think this is a problem with when people are in their silos, like the people who are watching John Oliver are really into educating themselves. And he says, in a way, though, it's like preaching to the choir. They're right. already on board for this stuff. And I think as much as I love my science comedy show, so I think there's actually dual values in my science comedy shows. Um, the science comedy shows that I do where it's specifically for scientists and sciencey people, some of them have never heard of science comedy. And this, mm. this, I think, does motivate them to be better communicators or at least just have a laugh because science is very mentally taxing. So many people, you know, drop out because they don't <laughs> want right. to deal with all the terrible things that go along with it, but they have such an important job. So for that, I would say it's very much an emotional support. The part that I really like is I do way more non-science comedy shows. Like I only do those, you know, maybe once 
a month or, you know, less than that. But I do regular comedy shows at open mics, clubs, bars, whatever. Like, you know, the I used to say four to 11 times a week before pandemic. I don't know what it is now. Right. Um, also, that's a huge range. You have a week where you're like not sleeping or a week where you're like, yeah, tonight or whatever. Yeah. But four yeah. Or 11 is a lot. yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's why there's such a large range. I go hard one week. Next week mm-hmm. is like a light week is four, four shows in a week, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. Taking um, it easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think that going back to why I choose comedy, I think comedy has the power to bring all these different groups together. Um, and it does help people lower their defenses that I think the only way not to get, you know, spiritual or you let's know, go, let's go. Yeah, <laughs> I think the only way we're going to be able to move forward as a country together is to have people from both sides come together. It's not going to be me versus you, extreme versus extreme. And there is a lot of research, let's say, in climate change that most people are not these dismissive people or the alarmist people. It's just, they're kind of the loudest ones. Right. And we need the people who are more like moderate or in the center of the pack who are apathetic or cautious, but like not really, you know, they're, they're not going to go give a limb for anything. Right. Um, but yeah, you know, I have had it when like I have Trump supporters who seem to like my comedy and am I going to be like offended by that? Of course not because they're literally listening to science jokes. Like I'm okay with that. And if they don't, and I don't have a political agenda for anything. It's just, I tell you the facts. I have a fact, I have a joke about deforestation. I mean, it's just, so I guess my, my intended audience is, not necessarily the people who are always going to be interested in science, but those people eat my stuff up and I yeah. love it for them. They are, <laughs> they are great people to work right. for. It. So I like right. performing for everybody who will have me. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. You're like, what audiences, any audiences, so that's any, anyone, the whole world. Cause you're right. Att- someone's attention is, is a huge gift. No, performing at your science comedy shows is great because it's the only time where I say, where are my scientists at? And the whole room like erupts and people are cheering and waving their shirts. And otherwise it's everyone's like, oh, you can hear them all ordering drinks as you say the word science. <laughs> you're like, oh my gosh. Uh, by the way, shout out to your deforestation joke. I believe it's on your social media, right? It's so good. It is. So, and that one's interesting because I did that at New York Comedy Club and then I posted it and then I did a dual thing with them. Um, like uh, you share them and tag mm. them. And there were some people who did not like that joke. Like they were people are just mean. The Internet is mean. You have very people mean. who are very who are more receptive and they're like, wow, this is such a great joke. You know, this is such an interesting take. You you're not like you don't realize you're learning stuff about what the top things about deforestation are. Um, But then you have other people who are like, what does comedy come to? So people who just think that inserting any bit of science Mm -hmm. into comedy, they're like, this isn't a dick joke. But the funny thing is, if I do my science dick joke, which all of my dick jokes are based off of a scientific finding or scientific study, they don't complain about that. So. Right, right. So you're like, all of a sudden, you know, replace dicks with deforestation, which is a complicated thing to think about. <laughs> and people are, are all up in arms. Well, that's, a, you know, a third and maybe other audience that I know that all of comedy is, is well, all of comedy, but but it, no matter what kind of comedy you're doing, we're all thinking about, which is like the internet broadly, where I feel like, you know, it's one thing to perform for a room of scientists. It's another perform for a room of people who are there for a comedy show and to do, to use your language, to sneak science into it, which I think I'm so biased, but I think makes for a more refreshing show. Uh, but then there's the third, which is just every idiot on the internet who doesn't know what's going on, <laughs> myself included. Like, it's just a nightmare. Do you worry about, because because so you also work in journalism and I imagine that comments on articles, comments on videos, whether they're uh, comedy or serious journalism how do you handle how mean the internet is <laughs> no that's a great question <laughs> um yeah you know it's been interesting so when i was at nasa it wasn't that big of a deal like i didn't get that many people i would write for their magazine and i wouldn't get that many people coming to me with comments right uh but now i'm at a newspaper where we have online comments open and boy Mm. Some of those people get very, very mean and it's, it does make you feel like 
it, it does make me rethink how I, so I've read about climate change. It does make me rethink, you know, what studies I choose, like how solid is this? And uh, the big thing is I get a lot of climate deniers coming after me. Mm. Like I get written up in blogs. I get people attacking me on Twitter. Like I've muted them and stuff. And this is just how people are. Right. Um, but you know, they're a minority in the belief. Uh, they're, they're a minority in the sphere of climate scientists, or uh, climate science rather. They're just kind of the loudest, but they're just the ones you have to mute. Yeah. But yeah. I will say one thing um, in terms of dealing with negative comments, it's interesting on two different levels. For journalism, I have to write so many articles that after a certain time, like, I don't care. Like, I've just kind of stopped looking at mm. the um, comments. And then people who do have really nice comments, they will personally email me. Um, you know, you know, if an article does well, because there are other ways that you see it right. do well. So just because I'm busy and I guess I'm getting older and I realize like all these arguments against people, they're kind of quacks anyways. Um, well, maybe not quacks, but like there are nothing that it's the same arguments over and over again. So I'm just like, oh, I don't need to worry about that. I see. You're like, no matter what I say, it's going to stir up this set of complaints. Yeah. So but okay. now if I get a negative comment on my comedy, let's go. Or yeah. <laughs> something like that, that I like just obsess over. No, and the funny. Well, not so much anymore, because like I said, I have too many things to do. And, you know, people have their opinions. I think I'm just getting older and wiser. And after a certain time, you just get like so much criticism on everything you do, not because of you personally, but just because this is the sphere that you're in, which is science, climate science, comedy, whatever it is. You kind of, I guess, get a little immune to it. But I do know that when I would do my YouTube videos, I would get like just mean trolls, right? Like yeah. commenting nothing about the content because people would say really nice things about the content, but they would comment on like my appearance mm. or they would call me um, like, <laughs> I remember I have this joke where <laughs> I talk about how some people think the moon landing is fake. And then I compare that to because they didn't see it. And I say, well, that's ridiculous. Like I've never seen my parents mate before, but I know it happened <laughs> because I'm here. Yeah. And I remember somebody commented on it and was like, mm -hmm. ah, I bet you also think COVID is real. Oh boy. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> And the funny thing is, like, I don't respond to these people. Another person who said something like, oh, you should like something about my face, whatever. And uh, I am used to this. I just like would let it slide, whatever. My now husband is learning what it's like to be a female in the world. <sighs> and he sees these things. And he like when he saw the thing about my appearance, he's like, that's so rude and like deleted them and like all this stuff. And when he saw the one about the guy being like, I bet you think COVID is real. My husband hearted it. And I was like, what? What are you doing? And then the Whose side are you on? <laughs> and he was doing it to be funny. Yeah. Um, and then the guy commented again, be like, oh, you want to heart my comments, but like, don't want to blah, blah, blah. And then, um, I mean, at that point, like, because my husband's just at that point saying like, what would he do if we liked this? Right. Uh, he wants us to not like it. Right. Right. Um, so, yeah, that's been interesting. It's more interesting to see, I think, how my husband responds to negative comments <laughs> about me than me. <laughs> that is that is something I hadn't thought of that. My uh, boyfriend is is chronically not online, uh, but now I'm Good. kind of like I got to get him on social media to to mess with these people. Not that I'm getting that kind of attention. Well, another shout out to your YouTube and we'll post all the links and everything because um, gosh, it does awesome stuff on YouTube, including performing stand-up comedy for penguins, which is uh, <laughs> a personal favorite. Uh, no, but you are setting yourself up for, you know, the anti-science, science, science denier, whether it's climate or what have you. That's a whole vocal crowd, uh, very energetic, I would say, on the internet. And then posting any kind of comedy is inviting its own kind of like online heckling slash hate speech. <laughs> and so you're really in the thick of, of yeah, all of it. But it's no more than what you know, journalists get this all the time. Comedians get this all the time. Um, it's just the way the world works, you know? It, it, I mean, it, it shouldn't be that way. And, you know, there are people who are trying to fight bullying online and I appreciate those things. But, you know, if you stop doing what you want to do, and like I said, my goal isn't to change anybody's mind necessarily. It's just to 
show them a different perspective of something. Like, I just want to have fun. <laughs> All I want to do, number one, is make people laugh. As a comedian, that's my number one goal. So I'm always going to be working to that. And if you let the naysayers interrupt you in that journey, it's like, man, that was a waste of my last 10 years of my life. No. You know, it's brought yeah. me so many good things and it's something I enjoy. I feel like that I'm going to listen to that on repeat every time I <laughs> <laughs> worry about someone's going to say something mean if I keep doing this. So, oh, so thank it's you way for that. easier to say than to actually do. Wow. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll both listen to you on, on yeah. repeat. <laughs> So, so talk to me about the journalism side of things. Do you try to inject comedy into your journalism or is that like, we're serious over there? How does that, how do the two worlds interact in the other direction? That is a great question. Oh, thank you so much. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So a lot of the topics that I, it's all about the topic that you choose to write about. Um, I have been writing about a lot of really serious topics about climate science. I I write about extreme weather uh, um, Mm. mainly. So that is like hurricanes, you know, heat waves, things that are killing people in masses that I would obviously never write anything funny about that. I mean, sometimes you can find a story that's like a lighter perspective on it or like, you know, a a motivational story. So like in the midst of all this disaster, Mm. there's this one person who's doing this. But those stories don't really come up as much on my desk because I'm covering the news part of it. However, recently I did get my own column. Um, It's Congratulations. Thank you. It's called Hidden Planet. It's at the Washington Post. So you can just go there and Uh, look at my name and you'll see things that are labeled hidden planet. And that is an opportunity where I could just get to talk about really cool science stuff that's going on that's related to earth. And I get to insert jokes into those when appropriate. I get to pick like lighter topics. I get Mm. to do more interdisciplinary um, uh, studies and things that are science and art or whatever it might be. And the funny thing is, you don't have to be that funny in these articles. Like I wrote something about something called space hurricanes. And it's this new type of Aurora that scientists found. And I love space weather. I love talking about auroras. never seen one, but like, I know about the science of how they are created. Space physics is extremely difficult, but extremely fascinating to to learn about. Hang on. What's, Uh, what's an Aurora? I mean, I don't know anything about anything. Oh, sure. (laughs) Um, uh, It's also called the Northern Light. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. I know. I got it. Yeah. Yeah. So basically in, you know, the Arctic regions or like higher latitudes, um, you see these really beautiful dancing lights that look almost alien like. And that is all because of energy from the sun Mm. coming to Earth and interacting with our magnetosphere, um, our magnetic field. And it's just like physics and chemistry and that's pretty crazy that happens all the time. Um, well, they these guys found something called a space hurricane, which is located in like a different spot. And it's like spirally instead of like mm. shoots, which is what you normally see for a Northern Lights. Um, and I just inserted like two jokes in there, one for the top of the lead or whatever. And the other one was, I said, space hurricanes are a lot like hat and crunch, uh, like extra berry chocolate cereal. Um, (laughs) They vaguely resemble the original. And also you didn't know either existed before this article. Nice. Um, So it it was like a fine joke, whatever. Yeah. And so many people commented on that. I got so many emails. I have never gotten so many comments about me personally being like, this author is so great. Like, oh, so funny. People in the comments were like, yeah, and she does comedy. She's great. Like people on Twitter were saying, this is the greatest line that I've ever read. What? Amazing. Yeah. It was just like such a small thing, but I got way more positive feedback about articles where I insert just one joke. And also Mm. space hurricanes were really cool. Sounds cool. Um, Then I did writing about not even, not depressing stuff necessarily earlier, but just even neutral things about what the weather is going to be. Right. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) But yeah, so I mean, that was kind of cool. And I think that proves that, 
you know, I was pushing for this column because um, people want more humor in their lives. Yeah. People want more creative energy in talking about science. You know, it doesn't have to be funny. Um, you know, I just want people to think about this stuff creatively. And, you know, people seem to like it. So that's how I try to infuse nice comedy into my day job by creating a by letting my editors give me a column and picking uh, certain topics that allow for that a little easier. Oh, it's amazing. And so so Hidden Planet. So look up Kasha Patel, Hidden Planet. All right. Yes. Perfect. The I got to go title, read this. <laughs> the yeah. title is vague enough that uh, uh, I can choose whatever I want to write. About. <laughs> nice. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Yeah. It's called Earth. You're like, oh, perfect. Never write it. <laughs> so, OK. Amazing. And I think you're right. I think that probably I mean, the news is so depressing. I feel like it sort of historically always is. It feels and I think this is cliche to say, but it feels like it's just even more depressing and stressful as the days march on somehow. And so I'm sure that it actually meant a lot to people who are reading this, that there was any levity whatsoever uh, in the context of something serious. And, you know, you get to learn something in the process. What yeah. what what is next for Kasha Patel? Do, are you continuing more writing, more speaking? things proceed as, as what, what's happening? What, what do you, what do you, what's, what are you planning next? Wow. What a question. Yeah. Where do you see yourself in five years? <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah. or even five hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I'm not going to say anything novel in this next sentence, but I think I'm starting to realize how different the past few years were um, pandemic. You know, we all tried to do the best that we could dealing with stuff. And I do think that virtual shows, you know, I did like over what, like over 300 shows in a year, like 250 shows in a year. So I was definitely keeping up with it, but it's not the same. And um, then I was planning for like this wedding and, you know, that takes like so much energy. I was, Congratulations, uh, by the way. Thank Kasha you. just got married. <laughs> Amazing <laughs> wedding photos. Now I'm just like being <laughs> creepy, but. <laughs> we, oh yeah, we did yeah. a sign. Yeah, I don't know if I told you all the things now, but now I'm just talking. Yeah, um, I did. We made the reception science theme. No way. Yeah. Yes. So we had like space images on the walls and stuff. And we had like galaxy themed like cake and all kinds of things. Oh and my then, God. Amazing. Um, for like our, uh, we did it. Oh, we had like a newlywed game that we did at the reception where um, I, my husband's an accountant. And uh, so I had to answer questions about accounting and he nice. had to answer questions about science. And he's like very smart. And I don't know much about things outside of science, even not even that much in science, <laughs> really, if we're being honest. So, but we had a little like laser and that laser thing, buzzer thingy. And if mm -hmm. we got it wrong, they like shocked us. Oh um, my gosh. <laughs> Some Milgram. Like, yeah. Wow. It, it wasn't that bad, but it was like yeah. a Tesla coil kind of thing. So that was okay. neat. And then um, we did an experiment. We did elephant toothpaste, which is, um, I had like lab coat on that said Mr. And I had Mrs. He had Mr. And we had a person, we had our goggles on and stuff. And we like mixed a bunch of things together. He had his big um, Erlenmeyer flask, I had mine. And then we dumped it in at the same time. And elephant toothpaste, it creates this huge foamy um, mm. reaction that like shoots up into the air. And uh, we had different colors and it was a competition of like who could do a better um, science experiment. And who won? won? Yeah, good. I perfect. Won, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did feel bad because like this is my chemistry part of me coming out. So I'm like getting down to like eye level and seeing yeah. the meniscuses and all this stuff. And he doesn't know any of that. Right. Did you have a uh, everyone sit down and prepare a 2022 tax return and see if he could do it better? <laughs> Oh, he would have loved that. But yeah. no, it was in our wedding was in July. So I don't think that was a thing yet. No, I see. All right. Yeah, not you got to You got to get married. Renew your vows during tax <laughs> season to give your your husband uh, uh, another chance. I feel like even just the fact that you had a flask, but like not like a drinking, like a chemistry tool <laughs> at your wedding. That alone is is awesome. And, and see, yeah, science. Science themed weddings. OK, I'm not like a big wedding person, but now I'm like officially going to go and be like, how can we make more science themed weddings? That's <laughs> that's amazing. It was uh, well, it was cool. I'll post pictures and video and things. So. Um, all right. Perfect. But anyways, yeah, what you were saying about what's going to come up. Well, I hope this year will be a big year. Um, I am reinstating my science comedy shows, not just in D.C., but around the country. I have a lot of 
places that are asking me to do comedy. And then we have, I think I'll be doing this with you, Andrea, but we're going to so. be on a little science comedy tour, which I think will be really fun. We'll do East Coast and West Coast. Um, I think we're looking into the fall. And then hopefully I will, you know, I want to record something and put that out. I have so much material and I don't put it out on social media because I'm trying to, you know, harness that that material. You know, what it was like in pre-pandemic is you wait until Netflix approaches you or Comedy right. Central, then you put it out. But during pandemic, people just put stuff out and then it became, oh, you use your material to get the followers right. instead of like, I don't know. People aren't seeming to uh, save their material until they're special anymore. So right. maybe that's what I have to do now. No, I have the same feeling. I'm like, I can't post my jokes. I'm still working on my jokes, my precious <laughs> jokes. It's like, first of all, 12 people are going to see it and they're going <laughs> to scroll past it. So get over yourself. You can post it 10 times. No one's going to see it. Uh, and second, yeah, the whole model does seem to be changing. But do you think it's a good thing for science comedy to get you, you know, if you had such a, a huge following or, or a lot of shows over Zoom, it seems like social media could actually be a friend of of this. Yeah. You know, in the past few days, I was thinking about that because I'm trying to find headliners for my science comedy shows. And it's so difficult to find anybody on the Internet because like I Google stuff and it's me. And I'm like, well, <laughs> this isn't that helpful because I'm yeah. only one person. Um, but even the jokes that I have on there, I've done science jokes about literally every topic you could possibly think of. And I think just posting that more and just bringing that into people's phones, living rooms, whatever it is, I think that one helps with people knowing what else is out there. But it also just helps people relate to it. So I think especially for science comedy, there's just so many people not doing it. Right. That I think it's almost a service that we should provide, you know, we think of live shows, but you know, now we have digital media and that's another way of sharing our craft that is equally, if not more important, just because of how viral things could go. That's a very positive take on social media. And I like it. How can someone listening get involved in science comedy, whether they're coming from science, coming from comedy, coming from neither, what, what would you recommend? Well, I guess it depends on what, uh capacity they want to be involved in if they want to be a performer uh my thing is you know just go out there and do it I read books I watched a lot of stand-up comedy it's a lot I mean every stand-up comedian will tell you that the best thing you can do to improve your comedy is getting stage time mm -hmm. now that's a terrible terrible thing you have to do because mm -hmm. the that some of these people make you go through it's nothing that I especially if you're older no self-respecting human would want to go through that stuff unless you're like 15 like unless you're 21 and still have hopes and dreams you know right <laughs> um, but yeah so I would say you know get as much stage time as you can if that's what you want to do and then I would actually pass the ball to Kyle Marion who we talked about previously in this episode um, she does a lot more scientist training than I do. I used to do that and I can still do it if I need to. I do workshops and stuff, but in terms of one-on-one -on -one stuff, I yeah. think she does a more focused group with that. Whereas, um, um, I don't know if you want me to help you, I can. <laughs> that's like, oh, that's, that's Kasha being like, don't email me. Okay. <laughs> I'm busy. Me, I'll help you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Work you, workshops uh, are cool. I like doing workshops for a group of people. Those are right. fun. Yeah. Right. Right. Cool. Very good. All right. I have two final questions for you. My, my second to last question, this probably is unfair, but what would you say the biggest misperception people have is about science, the folks who are like, no, I don't like it. Or what is it that you wish people who think, ah, I don't care about science. What is it you wish people knew about science that they don't like what, what, or maybe my question just is, what do you like so much about it? <laughs> um, no, I think that your first question is fair. I think people seeing I think people don't see science as accessible. And I think that is true to a certain degree, but it's not. When I say to a certain degree, I'm like PhD. Yeah, like right. if you're reading a PhD dissertation, that might be a little more difficult to read for an average per person. But 
I think that people don't realize how important science is in everyday life. And they don't even realize that they're being little scientists themselves. Right. Like I am not, I do not like baking necessarily baking desserts because you can do everything right. And then you can mess it up at the last minute when you put it in the oven. And I learned so much from these kids baking shows, which are incredible (laughs) to watch and how good they are. And these kids are learning so much science when they're baking and math with the measurements and all of these things that I have to look up and I don't know that much. Um, So I think science is accessible in a lot of different ways that people don't realize. And two, scientists don't know everything. I think that's another thing. Like I am in the field of science journalism, but yeah, I know stuff but I don't know everything. And the best thing that you can do is go out there and educate yourself. You don't have to know everything. You don't even have to be quote unquote, what you think is smart. You don't have to have a PhD. You don't have to have a master's or even a college degree, you know, to be good at science. It's just a lot of personal curiosity out there. So um, there's a lot of good resources that if people want to learn things, you know, be mindful of where it's coming from. What? Okay. Here's my last question. Uh, and I meant it to be more lighthearted, but now I feel like it's opening a whole other thing, but, um, are your parents still hoping for you to go to med school or when did, (laughs) when did you get decide that you were, you were free from that expectation? (laughs) I want to go back. I want to go to medical school now. (laughs) Really? Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah, you already have a PhD, so you're already a doctor. Um, not think- not one that can help people, and and not according to Republicans, but yes, <laughs> technically. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I think that I think especially during pandemic, um, <laughs> that was like the moment where I was like, man, I should have been a doctor. You know, because mm. doctors are always really important during life. And then that happened. And I was like, oh, snap, this could have been a good path for it. Like, I see why doctors are extremely, extremely respected. And when you're growing up around doctors, you're like, oh, no, that's just my dad. <laughs> yeah. Um, but now then you see the impact that they have. And I don't know, I just really understand and admire what they do. Also, as a journalist and comedian, I would not say no to that money. <laughs> Yep. (laughs) That's a lot of money. And it's a way more straightforward path than being a comedian or a journalist. Um, Yes. But I will say that I don't know if my parents expect me. I think if my, I I think they would be okay if I went back to medical school. I think they'd brag about it to their parents or to their (laughs) friends. Um, But what happened was when I was in grad school, I got my, I got an internship at NASA that turned into a job and they were like, oh, and then I also got a Gates Foundation scholarship to go to Kenya and report on the public health care system there. So I think getting that mm. and getting the job in government, my parents were like, oh, okay, you're going to be okay. Right. You make a secure <laughs> living. And I mean, I, I do have a secure living, knock on wood. Um, right. But yeah, I think they're pretty proud of, you know, my my non-doctor pathway. <laughs> Very good. Well, I, I would be proud. Uh, that's probably a weird thing to say. But um, I mean, look, it's always nice to know if when in doubt, you can go back to med school. If you're like, you know what? I'm sick of science comedy. Uh, Dr. Patel is in the house. No, I'm, I am not surprised that they're very proud and and you've done amazing things. So on behalf of all of us, some of us, all of us are glad that you're not a doctor (laughs) because then we wouldn't have, uh, your awesome writing and thinking and comedy and all those things. So where can people find you, follow you? I've already talked about pretty much all of your social medias, but what's the, where should people go? Sure. Also, I should clarify on the doctor point. I think it'd be kind of hard for me because like uh, I do not like needles or blood. Yeah. I see. Even yeah. Episodes of House. I've been like binging that lately. I'm like, mm. oh, this is so graphic for Fox. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like someone getting a vaccine. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could never do it. <laughs> um, yeah. So where to find me? I mean, honestly, anywhere you are, I will be. <laughs> where you lead, I will follow. Nice. Um, yeah, um, YouTube and Instagram, 
I would say are the two where I try and post most of my comedy videos. I have some new videos in the mix. Um, I went to Singapore recently and did some comedy there. And then I have some new things that will be coming out. Um, also just like fun science-y education videos, talking about like really cool scientists that I like and inserting jokes into those. Um, and yeah, YouTube and Instagram is probably where I post like also regular jokes and stand-up comedy clips. So I would, I would put forth my Instagram, but also if you like Twitter, that's where I post a lot of my articles. All right. Perfect. So, and it's all Kasha Patel or Kasha G Patel. I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have a split thing. So YouTube and Instagram are Kasha Blanca because that's right. fun Kasha. That's fun and, Kasha. Kasha yeah. Blanca. Okay. And my Twitter and Facebook, I think are Kasha Patel and that's like serious. Right. Right. It's so it's like, serious. do you want fun Kasha or serious Kasha? Pick your, it's, choose your own adventure. Yeah. It's more like, um, Kasha Blanca was what I used when I was young. And then by the time I wanted to change it, Kasha Patel was taken. We'll get them back with, with exactly. your net worth. We'll, we'll buy them out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kasha. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you to everyone who listened, go check out all of Kasha's things, go to a show, go to a Zoom show, go to a real life show, follow her around the world, but be nice about it. And uh, uh, join me in letting her know how awesome she is. Thank you, Kasha. This was amazing. Thank you. And then hopefully come see both me and Andrea yes. on tour later this year. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, yeah, that'll be awesome. I'm very excited about that. I keep forgetting. It's like excited. a dream, right? I'm like, oh yeah, but it's, yeah. Science it might, comedy tour. It might be real. It might <laughs> yeah. be real. All right, cool. All right, thanks, Kasha. Bye, yeah, everyone. thank you. <laughs> And that's our show. Thank you so much for joining us for season two of Majoring in Everything. We're very excited to bring you all the amazing guests we've got for you this season. Don't forget to keep majoring in everything yourself. And Eric, did I do it? Is this a good second outro? See you next time.